All right, I think we're ready to start. Well, welcome again, everybody. I'm Laura Duggan, broker owner of West Austin Properties, and tonight I have a special treat for you. I have David McCollum with uh, McCollum Realty Consultants with us, and he is going to teach us about real estate appraisals defining home values for buyers and sellers. Now, I have to tell you, um, I've been in business now for almost 33 years, and most real estate agents do not have the training that you're going to get tonight. I know that could be shocking, <laughs> <laughs> but it is true. So tonight what we're going to talk about are the important role that the appraiser plays in the home sale or purchase. We're going to talk about how the guidelines have changed and who is affected. We're going to talk about three approaches to value. David's going to go over all three of those approaches and how the appraiser selects and adjusts comparable properties because that's a really big uh, item in doing an appraisal. And then we're going to talk about briefly the benefits of having your home appraised before you put it on the market. So let me introduce David to you tonight. He is a graduate of the University of Texas and a member of the Appraisal Institute, which uh, is a designation, MAI, and he'll tell you what that means. He's also a designated realtor broker, and I didn't know this, but David told me tonight that you had to be licensed to uh, even be an appraiser. Is that right, David? Yes, back, when, back in the early 80s when I started, you had to have a salesman's license to be able to appraise. So that, that was new to me. So we are really, really glad to have David tonight. He's got a lot of great information for you. And a lot of the slides that you're gonna see, he actually developed to train real estate agents so that when they come to your house and talk to you about the value of your home, they've had this training. So we're gonna go ahead and get started tonight. And uh, David, why don't you just go over a little bit about what an appraisal is and well, it's important to note that an appraisal is really an opinion of value. Um, we use different methodology and theory to develop that opinion of value, but it is a subjective number. It's not a science. It's We go through a process, a process a to get to that number, but it is, in the, at the end of the day, it is an opinion of that appraiser's value. That's right. But you could probably have three different appraisers do an appraisal of a property and all you guys are going to come in pretty close to the I same would, number. I would expect to be within three to five percent right. if, if you had three different appraisers. And right. there's some variables there. This, you know, the measurement's a little off between the, all the appraisers, but it, it should be pretty consistent. I know I had an opportunity to uh, have a, an estate valued recently and uh, just to make sure all the beneficiaries thought the number was fair. We had three different appraisers come and appraise the property, and they were within ten thousand dollars of the same that's, number. That's pretty good. Yeah. So, and it was around a five hundred thousand dollar house. I thought that was excellent. So, what it, what an appraiser is not. <laughs> and this is pretty important because um, all the time when I call the homeowner to set up the time to go out and to do the appraisal, like, well, the appraiser's already been out here. I said, well, I don't think so. Are you sure? Because, yeah, he, he looked at my AC unit, he was up on the roof, and ah. that's not what appraisers do. An appraiser is not a home inspection. We don't look at the mechanical, the structural. We're not experts in that area. So, as Laura will tell you, she'll always recommend to get a home inspection any time you buy a house, but that is not part of the appraisal process. Right. However, I do want to point out that sometimes... Uh, real estate agent will recommend that you do an appraisal and a home inspection during an option period time. But they are two totally different tasks. A home inspector is there to look at all the mechanicals and they have a list that they go through and of course the appraiser has uh, that value report at the end of that. So the role. Well, like it says, the role of the appraiser is to provide objective, impartial, and unbiased opinions. Um, as we'll talk about later, they're trying to get that unbiased. It's a predominant aspect of the market these days. Um, we're supposed to be unbiased. We're not supposed to judge on one side or the other. 
Right. It's true market value. We're supposed to pull market comps and not be influenced by the buyer, the seller, the lender, or anybody. Right. And you know, I think that's really important too because um, regardless of who you are, whether you're the buyer, the seller, or a lender, you want the real number. That's true. You correct. want a defensible number at the end of the day. Well, and the way the market's now with the the money being tight and the lenders having to be more cautious, um, the appraiser has to be sure that the number is supportable. I always look at it like if I have if I'm on uh, the courtroom, if I'm up in that chair, am I going to be able to defend this defend this number? Right, I can understand that. And you know the other thing is if a lender is using the the property is collateral for the loan, then you got to make sure the value is there. Right. So, all right. Um, and the qualifications, appraisers do have to be certified. Yeah, it wasn't always that way. Like I said, when I first started, you just had to have a salesman's license. Um, that was important, but it really didn't get everybody on the same page as far as what kind of qualifications an appraiser had to have. Um, I guess it was in the mid to late 80s when um, the state certification process came out. Um, there's different levels of certifications. There's appraiser, you start out as a trainee, you have to work underneath somebody for, I believe it's two years, mm -hmm. and then you can be state licensed and state certified. Now there's two levels of certification. There's certified general, which can do residential and commercial properties, mm -hmm. and there's certified residential, which is just residential properties. Right. And that is all through regulated through the Texas Appraiser Licensing and Certification Board. Um, and I know you're MAI, so tell us what that means. The MAI is not part of the certification process. It is, I guess if you'll equate it to the CPA, if you pass the CPA okay. exam. The Appraisal Institute is the foremost authority on appraisal. It's pretty much widely recognized worldwide as the ultimate in the appraisal industry. So it's a lot of coursework and then you have to prove, I'm sure. That's and correct. And there's a big test that. we have to take. Well, that's great. So look for an MAI appraiser for well, sure. Well, for residential, there's going to be more SRAs and oh, okay. that. MAI, I'm probably one of the few, if only, MAIs right now that does residential property in Austin. Really? Well, that's good to know. And let's talk about, just briefly, who, who would hire you? Who would hire you? My main clients are mortgage brokers or lenders. Right. Um, I do have a lot of clients who are just banks and savings and loans. There's a different kind of, not the different kind of process nowadays for hiring what kind of appraiser they can hire and and how they actually go about getting the actual appraiser that goes out to your property. Right, because I think uh, some of the lenders that we use have a, a, a pool of appraisers that they have done business with, know to be knowledgeable in their field, and it's not just potluck like some of the... Well, be before the HVCC came into play... You know what is that? It's the Home Valuation Code of Conduct. Oh. Um, the governor of New York, Cuomo, kind of started this thing a couple years ago. Um, before that came into play, a lender could pick up the phone and call whatever appraiser he wanted to come work for him. They tried, the HVCC tried to get away from that kind of bias. They were worried about right. somebody being in his hip pocket and be sure. able to make the numbers. Now the HVCC says it has to be a blind pick. So like you said, there's a pool or a rotation that a lot of lenders will use where it's they just go... Through eight or ten or whatever and it's a blind pick. Right. Yeah. Either that or they have to go through a company who does just the appraisal process and has no relationship with the lender. Right. And it, to me that's a little bit more chancy because you could get an appraiser coming from Houston or San Antonio to do an appraisal in Austin. I've had that happen where they just totally didn't know the property. Well, I I like it better on the rotation basis because if you go through the appraisal management companies, a lot of times those take part of the fee from the appraisers. Oh. And appraisers who only really need the work will do business with them and you end up 
in my opinion, <laughs> with not necessarily the best appraisal product out there. Exactly. So if you're if you're going to be a discount appraiser, I guess you're going to get a, right. <laughs> that's kind of the, what I'm thinking of it doing. All right. So you may want to get an appraisal uh, for several different reasons. Yeah, because it's not only just for people who are buying a home. It's not just always for the loan process. Um, that's probably the majority of the times people get an appraisal. But like Laura said, for if you are putting your house on the market, it might be a good idea to get an appraisal so you'll know what to price the property at. Um, a lot of people leave money on the table, and a three, four hundred dollar appraisal fee is nothing if you're leaving five or six thousand dollars on the table because you didn't price the house correctly. Right. It's a three between three and four hundred dollars to get an appraisal. For a typical appraisal, yes. And most real estate agents don't have the background or the knowledge or the training to get to the number that an appraiser does. So I think that's a very valuable tool. And not only do you know exactly or very close to what the square footage of the property is, because Real estate agents don't go out and measure properties. And tax records can be pretty unreliable. That's which exactly is where a lot, right. It's where all the agents most of the time get their square footage figures from is the tax rolls. And that's a real dangerous place to rely because if you've had an addition or... Right. And they try to be accurate, but in my 30 plus years of experience, there's a lot of times where they're way off. That's right. And I know uh, sometimes people will want an appraisal to use for a tax protest. For tax protest, um, I just got over a big round of that because the deadline just ex was over. But uh, yeah, for tax protest, for you know, if there's a divorce situation or estate right. valuations that you need, that's another reason to get an appraisal. Right, I I can see that, and def just to defend the price, the sales price, once you have an offer come in on your house. That's a valuable piece of information to have. Especially in tight markets. That's exactly right. Where there's not right. that many buyers and sellers and the buyers think they have the upper hand and they come in and try to lowball you. Then if you have an appraisal with market comps out there, you can say an expert thinks it's worth this. You're trying to get it for this. And it may be a little helpful when that appraiser for the lender comes around and wants to see what your comparables are. Right, then you have got, some ammunition there for exactly, them. Exactly. I've been known to leave one out on the kitchen counter. I've picked up a few myself. <laughs> All right. So uh, just to go through some definitions really quickly. Well, if we've got the appraiser, we've already kind of gone through that. Um, but we need to Let's be talk competent. Let's for sure, too. Um, we need to be independent and impartial. Those are important. An appraisal, it has to, if there's no value involved, it's not an appraisal. There are some reports out there that we do for lenders that are basically just drive out there, see if the property's on the ground, let me know that. That's not really an appraisal. And those used to be considered appraisals, like the little drive-by appraisal thing? Oh, there, there still are kind of drive-bys. <laughs> um, different forms. I don't know if we want to get into that, no, which forms, not, but not really. Um, but there are still drive-by appraisals, but they're also drive-by where there's no value submitted in the report, so right. that's not really an appraisal. That makes a big difference. Like Laura said, the client, that's an important issue because I'll, so many times I'll come out to the home and the buyer or the person, that, even if it's a refi, the homeowner will want to know what the value of that property is and I can't necessarily give them that value because they're not my client. Right. The person who hires me and is relying on that number is my client. That's often the lender or the banker or the broker. So the, if you're a seller or you're a buyer and you didn't directly hire the appraiser then that report does not belong to you. Now a lot of times the lender is fine with giving you a copy of it. I even think they pretty much have to if you request it. But it, it But I, it can't come through me. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Get that understood. All right. So we've just talked about intended user. It has to be the person that... It's who is relying on that report. Right. And the scope of the work? That's pretty much the groundwork for the whole appraisal. That's where we say, you know, what what we are doing the appraisal for, the process we undertake to get to the bottom line. Um, so we, it's kind of an outline for the appraisal. Right, because all of you have to use the exact same form. Well, Is there's different correct? kinds of valuations too, though. That can be value in use, it can be business use. So we have to tell the reader and the client what 
purpose and what route we took to get to that right market. I see okay okay so this kind of starts the valuation process and how we go about starting our appraisal report um, obviously we have to identify what the property is we're going to appraise um, and you have to have certain things on here for the reader to understand that's the property, that's the correct one. You know, it can be a, an address. A lot of times if you're doing a rural property, it doesn't really necessarily have a street address. So you can do a meets and bounds description or legal description or other. Okay. Highest and best use is very important. Um, I recently had to turn down an appraisal because the highest and best use was really commercial. It was zoned commercial services, even though there was a house there. It was a it used to be a single family house, but it was being used as office. Right. So I couldn't, since it was zoned commercial services, I couldn't appraise it as a single family. And I don't know why they wanted, other than the interest rates and stuff are better if they got it through right. single family. Sure. But I had to turn the report down because the highest and best use was not for single family residential. Right. Um, next we analyze and describe the property. Um, one story, two story, whether it's brick or composite and shingle roof. Um, Some just of the kinda, materials. The materials, the quality of construction, whether, you know, there's a pretty wide range from tract homes to million dollar custom homes right. on what kind of materials are put in there. Okay, and then here are our three approaches to value. Let's talk about those for a minute. The three approaches are the cost approach, income approach, and sales comparison approach. Now, we, we try to use all three of those in the report because what you're doing is you're trying to get values that support each other. Um, it's kind of a, a testing deal. So if you have a, a cost approach, you'll derive one number for that. You'll do the income approach, Usually for investment properties, you'll do an income approach, and you'll derive a opinion of value for the income approach. And then the sales com comparison approach uses market sales to derive your value. At the end of the day, you take those individual numbers and you reconcile them for the overall value. So which one really is the most important when you're going to do an appraisal um, on a residential property? Which one do you normally put the most emphasis on? Well, there it differs. If you've got a brand new house, then the cost approach should tell you a lot. Um, there's no depreciation to calculate. Oh, that's interesting. So on a new home, that would be an important. Right, but if you've got a 75-year-old house, you've got so much depreciation that's right. occurred, it's, it's difficult to estimate what the depreciation is, so the cost approach loses some of its weight. Right. I see that. For instance, though, an income approach might be the most important if you've got a duplex property. Right. But typically, the sales comparison approach is what most people are looking at. And we'll just kind of quickly go through the process of the cost approach. Um, these days, it's really tough to estimate site value because there aren't any lot sales out there. Right. Um, then you estimate the replacement or reproduction costs of the improvements. Like I said, then you have to back off what the depreciation has been. There's, you can see the three types of depreciation. Um, physical is the most common. Um, external, an example would be if, you're, if your house is next to a railroad track. Right. Or okay. in the flight path of an airport. That's external obsolescence. Okay. Um, functional, if, if you don't have enough bathrooms or right. if you have to walk through a bedroom to get to another bedroom, that's kind of a functional depreciation. I saw a sunken master bath the other day. <laughs> you were in a 1960s or 70s home. Well, that might be great for, you know, a 30-something, but when you're in your 50s, you don't want to sink down to the... Well, that, well and that's a good point, because as the population gets older, there might be different functional items that come into play down the road. That's exactly right. All right, uh, on just the cost approach, again, you, uh, you're going to estimate the site value... Like I said, there had, with this market, there hadn't been many site and lot sales out there, so that's a really difficult thing to do. So if we don't have actual sales, we'll try to use either listings and back off, or right. sometimes we'll even have to go to the tax rolls and try to find out what they've assessed properties for. I see. Okay. There's a difference between the replacement cost and reproduction cost. Typically, we'll use the replacement cost. 
in a historical home, an older home, when they've got like actual hundred-year-old posts or right. stone and stuff, we'll try to do the reproduction cost. That doesn't usually come into play, and it's pretty difficult to actually estimate costs of those kind of materials. And then we talked we about talked depreciation about and. Uh, and here's the as the as is value of side improvements. That's kind of a good thing to talk about because swimming pools, for example, comes up all the time. How much is my swimming pool worth? Well, I always tell people that if, if you really want a pool, that's fine, but it's better if you buy a house with a pool in it already. That's right. You get a free pool. <laughs> Not quite free. Not quite free, but it's definitely discounted. Yeah, definitely. Um, Over well, the cost of the that's pool right. bill. Because the as-is value, that cost does not always equate to value. Um, swimming pools, it's like driving a car off the new car lot. It depreciates instantly. Right. And, you know, there are... A lot of the cost of a pool can be the site cost of installing it. So Absolutely. if you've got to dynamite to get well, the... If you're in Northwest Austin, whether it's you're sitting on bedrock, to cost, get the same product, it costs a lot more money to put that pool in. That's exactly right. And see, a pool is a pool. That's right. Once it's in the ground, it's just The value's pool. the same. But the cost to get there changes. What about landscaping? That's a tough one for appraisers. Um, because it's so object objective or subjective, I should say, to the person looking at that property. If it's over the top, we'll give it some value. But if it's just normal, I get all the time, well, I've got this 100-year-old oak tree in my front yard. That's hard for us to put a number on. Right. Um, so it might be that those kinds of things, pools and landscaping and that type of thing, will draw a buyer's interest. That's right. It's helping in marketing the home, but, but it's hard to value it. It doesn't necessarily increase the actual value of the house right. from an appraiser's dollar standpoint, but for, definitely for marketing purposes. So the income approach, we've kind of talked about that. And, um, we do the same thing in the income. In the sales comparison, you'll get market sales. Well, in the income approach, you'll try to get market rents. What other right. homes in the area are renting for that are similar to your subject. And we'll make adjustments to those based on the different characteristics. Right. So the sales comparison this is, approach. This, this is the one that's going to affect most everybody. This is the biggie. Um, and underwriters who work for the lenders or go through the appraisals and try to see whether they meet guidelines so they can sell their reports on the secondary market typically. They have their list of guidelines that they go through. They open their little book and they check off the things and these are some of the things that we have to comply with. Um, and so when you get an appraisal, it's not like you can just go willy-nilly picking a sale here and sale there. They want them to be within one mile of the subject. Okay, so this is not only the lender that wants this, not only your loan officer that you've talked to and he's taken all your information and he gets this report back and he looks at it, but it goes now to even another layer at the lender, and that is the person who's going to underwrite the loan. Yes. They, the loan officer doesn't always like their underwriter. Because that's their, that's their fail-safe. That's their safety net. That's right. Um, that's why it's also important, everybody, to have local underwriting. That is important. And I can tell, I can even tell when there's a new underwriter. Can you really? Oh, they are much more by the book. They question you on every little thing. I, you know, I've got several different clients, and I pretty much have to write reports for the underwriter that works for that client because I know I get to know what they're looking for, what kind of things they're checking off. So what, that is huge. The underwriter is the last say in whether that report gets approved and that loan gets approved. So important. So having a local lender with local underwriting and local processing, I think, is critical to successful well, this experience. Well, the, the experience and the knowledge of the market is pretty key. Yeah, I would agree with that. So let's talk about some of these guidelines now because they've gotten a lot tighter. Well, you can tell within one mile of the subject, if you're not in a tract home subdivision, that's very difficult to do. That could even be difficult in Circle C. Sometimes, well, yes, because Circle C is pretty spread out. So even if you're in Circle C, you could be two miles away. Exactly. Um, 
with the diff with the changing of the markets, um, six months is pretty much as far as I'd like you to go back. You can go back 12 if you're in a rural area or it's kind of a unique type of property. They'll let you go back more. But but you can't go back for your convenience to substantiate a value. No. You have to use the most recent And that sales. goes back to sitting in the courtroom yeah. trying to defend your report. If somebody's looking at report and you've got sales that are 11 and 12 months old, but yet there's one just as comparable that sold two months ago, they're going to ask you why didn't you use that one as opposed to the old ones. And a market can really change a lot we've, in 12 we've months. We've seen that over the last couple of years. We really have. Um, now the net and gross adjustments, um, to explain that, each each adjustment line on their appraisal, say we're adjusting for a view. Right, because um, the house that you're appraising has a better view than maybe a comparable seller or vice versa. Right. So if we make a $25,000 view adjustment because there's a view of the lake, um, it can't, that adjustment, if it's more than 10% of the overall price of the house, then we have to explain why we had to do that. The gross adjustments are if you add up all the adjustments for that one comp, take away the pluses and the minuses, that's the absolute adjustment. It can't, it can't be can't more be, than 25%. That's right. So what are some of the things you would adjust for besides a view? I mean, they, there can be a lot of them, but... We'll get to that later, okay. but, but there are, the main things are, well, the, to me, the biggest thing is for the buyer's closing cost that oh. has to come off the top. Okay, the so if you have a $250,000 sale and the seller's paying $5,000 of the buyer's closing costs. That needs to come right off the top because that's just an artificial increase to the sales price. So the value there is going to be two forty-five. dollars less, less the amount that the seller paid on the buyer's Interesting. behalf. Interesting. Okay. That wasn't always the case. That's Luckily, ABOR has put that on their, their MLS listings now. We used to, as appraisers, not really know about that. We'd have to call and make phone calls and try to get that number. Now, ABOR is the Austin Board of Realtors. That's Sorry. what we in the field call <laughs> ABOR, Austin Board of Realtors. But in our MLS, uh, when a property sells, the real estate agent has to go in and fill out what the sold price was, how much the loan was that the buyer took out, what their interest rate was, what, the kind, what kind of loan it was. Um, and now, as uh, he was saying, you have to also put how much of the buyer's closing costs that the seller paid. So, and repairs also. Repairs, yes, you do. That helps us. The biggest thing that helps us now in the, looking at the MLS, MLS listing is there's room for 25 photos in there. I know, that is so good. We can enough. click through and see the quality and condition of every house because we can't go inside every house, but being able to view those photos is a big help to the appraiser. You know, I tell real estate agents all the time that professional photography means the world. I mean, when you can really see a house right, and get good, wide, information-packed photography, that's, that's, a high, that's a house's interview for a buyer. Well, I've noticed now with the amount of photos on there that the agents don't hype up their verbiage yeah. <laughs> as much as they used to about, oh, the best house on the street, and right. now we can actually see what it's like. It is what it is. All right, let's move on. Paired sale analysis, that's kind of a mythical thing in the appraisal industry. Everybody, every appraisal course talks about it. Um, ideal situation is you have two houses that are identical except for one aspect. That way you can put those two comps together and the difference in the sales price is attributed to that characteristic. In real life, that doesn't really exist. In theory, that's what they want you to do. In real life, it doesn't exist. It just doesn't happen. That's what we strive for, but it's tough to do. But you do get as, in your comparisons, you do get as close in square footage as you possibly can. Absolutely. Is square footage more important or number of bedrooms or how does that work? It depends on the property. If you have a property that is defined by a certain characteristic, for instance, if it's a waterfront property, mm -hmm. then that becomes the most important right. aspect of that property. So you're looking at only other waterfront properties, because to adjust for waterfront they're, yeah, would be Yeah, because they're not apples. I mean, they're apples and oranges right. at that point. They're not yeah. the same animal. Um, what we're talking about. Well, the, the square footage adjustment. I think you know. Um, 
for example, if you've got a house that's 2,500 square feet, you're not going to uh, compare it to one that's 3,500. Correct. You're going to try You'll to try get, to You try to get comps that are as similar to that subject as you can possibly find. And would square footage be one of the main drivers? It would be the top, one of the top ones. I would say location right, is probably the first. Or subdivision the area. Um, And then square footage, mm -hmm. and then probably your built okay. lot size possibly. They're, those are all right up there. All right, we already talked about swimming pools. Yeah, <laughs> but that's a good example because people, I've appraised homes where a guy was going to put in a $85,000 pool. It's going to have flames coming out. It's going to have a grotto <laughs> going way out. And I told him, I might give you $40,000 in value for that pool. For an $85,000 pool. We have to appraise towards a typical buyer and seller. We can't do to one extreme or the other. Right. And that's kind of a white elephant situation when that happens. Well, so, so many people out there don't even want a pool. Right. That's true. So that limits the market right there. Exactly. So here, we, this is what we were talking about, to find the best comparables. Now this is what a real estate agent will do. They're going to prepare something called a CMA or a comparative market analysis. And we're going to go in the MLS and we're going to find the best comparables that we can. But you all actually have some other resources that we don't have. I mean, I know the MLS is probably your biggest That's probably one. the vast majority of the, of the process we go through. And really, we'll, builders will get a lot of information from them. Mostly the builder information is a lot of cost data we'll get from them. Um, we used to be able to use, if somebody owned their own lot and the builder came and put a house there, we could use that, combine the two for a comparable. They won't let us do that anymore. It has to be... The builder has to have the site and build a house to be able to use that comp. Wow. Um, the and second one there is yeah, the biggie. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because I've had agents, I'll take an offer on a, a listing where I'm representing the buyer, and and the, the other agent will say, well, all of these other houses in the subdivision are listed at this. And I said, but they're not closed. You can put whatever price on it you want. It doesn't mean somebody's going to pay you that yeah, price. Yeah, it's not a wish. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually based on closed sales. And this next one is kind of why I started these kind of courses that I've done. Um, I do teach a course at the Austin Board of Realtors about appraisal process and theory. And I was spending so much time on the phone with individual agents trying to explain, she's, you know, I get these phone calls, why didn't my house make it? Everything in the neighborhood is going for $150 a square foot, but yours only came in at $140 a square foot. Well, if you do a little analysis there, every one of the comps she's using is probably was smaller than our house, which tends to increase the price per square foot, or some of them might have had a swimming pool, which increases the price per square foot. There's so many variables in the the price per square foot number that, that. that it's you can't really just go on that. And to make an adjustment per square foot, explain that because that's a little tricky too. You don't get full value for the difference. That's coming. That's coming okay, later, and that's okay, one of good. the things that's kind of hard for people to understand. But really, I would I would really beg agents to look at using dollar adjustments when they do their CMAs as opposed to anything per price per square foot. That's a very good point. And then the last one is obviously don't just take your numbers and average them up. Try to find out what comp you think is the best comparable and mm -hmm. you can put more weight on that one. Right. If, like if you got one that sold two doors down, that might be a better comparable than one that's half a mile away. Put more weight on that one. Do a weighted average instead of just a simple average. I think one of the problems is, David, that in the in the uh, our MLS we have something called a quick CMA, and it does those averages automatically. So then an agent jumps to that figure right. as the right one. Whereas, like you said, if you would just figure out which is the most recent comparable sale and use that as your and do your own adjustments on it. Don't rely on the statistics that the MLS does that spits out a price per square foot based on the your area as a whole. Um, it does make a difference, and you'll get a much more accurate number. <laughs> we try to get rid of those guys. But <laughs> no problem.
So let's talk about the guidelines per, for preparing a CMA. We, you, we want to stay in the same subdivision as the subject. Well, even within the same subdivision, you can get difference in values. Um, but primarily try to stay as close to, in the same subdivision as possible um, and within one mile of the subject. I know that's going to be hard to do a lot of times, especially in rural properties or properties where you've got acreage lots that are spread out. But, you know, these are guidelines. And then uh, limiting your range and square footage to no more than 20% on either side. That's a good one. Like Laura said, don't pick a 2,000 square foot house if your subject is 3,000 square feet. They're just not the same type of property. Exactly. And they're, most of the time, they're even going to have different amenities. That, as they get larger, they're going to be more loaded. Your quality is usually going to be better. They're going to have upgrades that the other ones aren't going to have. Exactly. All right. And then... We talked about this earlier a little bit. If, if you back to a golf course, try to find comps that back to a golf course or have a similar view. Um, if you're on a cul-de-sac, you might try to pick other comps that are on cul-de-sacs. That right. plays a difference sometimes. And if I don't have a, if I don't have a subdivision per se, um, sometimes what I'll do is I'll take the attendance area of the elementary school and look right. at, at the closest homes to the subject in that attendance area. If school makes a big difference there, that makes a lot, a lot of sense. And then FHA, let's talk about that a minute because there are a lot of FHA buyers out there right now. I would say last year FHA loans were down. I didn't do many FHA appraisals. I think in the last two months probably 60% of the loans, the appraisals I've done have been FHA. Um, it's, Money's a little, they, you don't have to put as much down, so it helps the borrower get into the house. Now but that there might are, change again, too, because we're getting a little stricter FHA regulations, right. but for now... But there are stricter underwriting guidelines for FHA. Um, they, won't let you, you, they still want six months, but they won't let you go back more than eight months. Okay. Um, there's a lot more explaining you have to do if you go outside of these guidelines. This is the one we talked about. These are, um, we're going to go through some rules of thumbs now on some of these adjustment I'm guidelines. Gonna let, I'm going to let you drive. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so this, this is one of my pet peeves. Um, and I'll tell you a story. I was just down at the appraisal district protesting a duplex property that I own. And the, some of the comparables that I took in had closing costs on there. And he said he couldn't take those off. He couldn't take that amount off. He said he wasn't, it wasn't part of their process. But really, it makes a difference. because you, you can put any number on there you want and it artificially inflates the value of that house. Now, it still has to appraise for that higher amount, but it's not the true value of that house. You right. have to take that number off of there. Um, you still want to get comparables that are similar in land size, but even if you've had in a subdivision, you can differ between, you know, a quarter of an acre, or a third of an acre. It's when you get into the larger. When you get into acreage lots, this still kind of holds true, um, but it's not a dollar for dollar adjustment. You don't take right. your, a $50,000 lot, and if it's twice as big, you don't make a $50,000 or $100,000 adjustment. It's it's kind of economies of scale, but this is a good rule of thumb. You, you do about 25% of the land value, and there's an example there of how that might be calculated. Um, right. Okay, we talked about the view. The view adjustment's difficult because there's a big disparity in views, whether and, it's a and water it becomes view, very a valley subjective. view, a city view. Um, I've done $100,000 view adjustments for panoramic panoramic lake views that are just drop dead gorgeous. You know, what price house would that well, be? No, <laughs> then, yeah, you're up in the $2 million price range. Right. So $100,000 is percentage wise is not that big of an adjustment. Design, we don't usually make adjustments for that because it's usually kind of grouped in with the other adjustments, like between a Tudor style house or a ranch style. We'll try to get the same design, if possible, mm -hmm. so that doesn't really come into play. Now, I can see, though, where if you had a Frank Lloyd Wright house or, or some 
uh, architect that would have been real notable or maybe right. something like that, but maybe a minor adjustment or... Possibly, and, but then again, you might, it might fall into quality. Okay, that would be a good point. Here's so quality. Here's quality. <laughs> and let me preface this by saying, we appraisers aren't going to pick every little bitty thing out. We can't, we're looking at, I get all the time, well, I've got, you know, glass front doors on my cabinets, or I've got this type of faucet in my bathroom. We can't be that picky. Right. It, we're, first of all, we're not that good. We don't have all these costs down. You are that good, though. <laughs> <laughs> we try to be that good. Um, so we're more in kind of general terms about quality. So one of the things I think it's important for sellers especially is if you've done a big remodel on your home, if you've got a list of every single thing that you did and about what you spent on it, that really does seem to help uh, you know, give you an idea as an appraiser what kinds of materials were used. Because you may get back to your office and think, oh gosh, was that... <laughs> Well, not only that, but you know, I've been appraising for over 30 years, and there's still some things that I see that I don't know what they are. Um, different newer materials or what have you, and it, it's good. I'd, we'd rather have too much information than not. Right, and then you can pick and choose. Because some of that does go in the line item of, of your sure. quality adjustment. But conversely, if you've got 24 karat gold faucets in right. there, that, you're not getting your money back for That's that. right, because people expect a, a faucet, don't they? <laughs> That's right. Different age adjustments. Um, it's like a car. It, it appreciates faster from day one to day two than it does from day one year to two year. Um, so we'll make different adjustments for different age groups of a house. So a new construction is going to have a bigger adjustment per se than like a 20 year old house would. So if you have a 1980s house and you're comparing it to a 1990s house, there wouldn't be a lot Not that of much of a difference. And if you're looking at a typical tract home house, you're probably talking about a thousand dollars a year or right. so adjustment for that. And you'll still want to group your houses and your, when you pick your comparables to the same kind of age group. And this this one talks about a little bit about the remodel. Uh, it's it's important not to combine quality and condition. The quality are the types of materials that right. are used, and condition is what the aging of look. those materials. <laughs> well, that's that's true. Um, so, carpet and paint are condition, but hardwood floors are quality. Now, how much does a uh, really spiffy new carpet, new paint really affect you as an appraiser. When you come in, you see all new carpet, fresh paint job, everything's looking pretty. <laughs> it, well, we're, we're people too. It does, it does help. Um, Makes you maybe want to stay a little longer <laughs> <laughs> to look at the rest of the Well, house. sometimes it is. It's the fact of a hard time finding comparables. If we're in a a subdivision like Violet Crown Heights or something where there's mm -hmm. a lot of remodels going on it's hard to find a comparable that is not has not been fixed up and so that would be an adjustment too but the other direction that's right interesting because people in general will fix up their house to sell it and so if we'll if we're doing an estate sale for an appraisal for an estate sale it's not necessarily fixed up and we have a hard time finding comps because everything in that market's been fixed right. up. right that's a good point and we talked about bedrooms. You want to try to stay within the same number of bedrooms. Yeah, generally. and this says, tells you we don't really make adjustments for bedroom count. It's kind of included in the gross living area yeah. adjustments, which is coming next, I think. Got the bath. Bathrooms, again, depending on the quality and size of the house, um, that adjustment will vary. Um, Here's the one that's kind of hard to explain and hard to understand. But it's important that you understand it. In my opinion, this is the this is hardest big. thing yes. to get, but it's the most important thing to understand, especially if you're a seller, figuring well, out that square footage. So when you get your comparable sales, and they sell for 300000 310000 whatever, then you get your price per square foot. And people always want to take that price per square foot and use as their gross living area adjustment. 
So what what he's saying is if it's if a house sold for a hundred and eighty dollars a square foot and the house that you're comparing it to is a little bit larger, say maybe by two hundred square feet, you cannot take two hundred square feet and multiply it by that hundred and eighty dollars. So that is the biggest mistake that real estate agents make. Because that number includes land, it includes there's a lot of variables in there. Um and again, a rule of thumb, this more often than not, in my experience, tends to work out to about 30 to 35 percent of that average dollar per square foot sales price. So, so that you, is certainly not full value. Absolutely not. Yeah. So and, that's, and you're right. That's where a lot of the problems come into play when people try to, when agents try to price their houses. Well, and unfortunately, agents are counseling their clients, their seller clients and going on listing interviews and using these kind of, of uh, comparisons. And that's why it's important if you will bracket the subject size of the house when you're doing your CMA, if you'll get some homes to compare it to that are some are bigger and some are larger. Mm -hmm. Some are bigger? If, if some of your comparables are larger uh -huh. than the subject and some of them are smaller, if you make, if you were to put that $180 square foot in there, you would tell right away that that's way out of line because right. you're going to have some really low and some really high. That's exactly So that's right. one way you can kind of adjust whether to use 30% or 40%. If, uh, if you make those adjustments and you've got a big variation in your adjusted prices, then go back up there and, and rework that number a little bit and maybe it'll come out a little more even. Right. All right, and then a garage, and it, probably this is more important than like an older house, the old, old houses? But not necessarily. A lot of these newer subdivisions, people are wanting three car garages. Mm -hmm. And if it, you have a two car, it could make a big difference. Especially if you're in a golf neighborhood. <laughs> well, there are a lot of golf cart garages too. Yeah. So. But not as important like Hyde Park or so, where a lot of houses don't have garages at all. It's maybe not that much of an adjustment. Because your comparables are Right, or the garage good. that the house has is 60 years old. Right, falling down. That's right. Uh, yeah, seen those. And then there's the adjustment basically perhaps for a porch patio or deck. Covered porches, arbored decks, those are probably a little bit more of an adjustment, but that's kind of a typical. And we talked about the pool not giving a dollar for dollar cost adjustment on that. You know, one that I think is a great um, feature is a sprinkler system. It looks like you get a pretty good adjustment. People don't, people don't like dragging those hoses around. No, they don't. You, you get pretty much close to the dollar on those sprinkler systems. That's and, a good investment. And it saves you money on your water too, so yes. that's a good one. Alright, I put together a list of what I call appraisal FAQs. How is an appraiser selected? We talked about that just a little bit. Um, but there's basically two ways. Well, there's appraisers that are selected for federally related transactions, like loans that are going to be sold on the secondary market, etc. And there are appraisers that are chosen by banks and institutions that are going to keep those loans in-house, or even by the homeowner who wants to pre-appraisal, etc. The first group for the federally related transaction has to go through that blind process. The rotation basis. The pool. The pool, the, pool. the rotation basis, or the appraisal management company. Right. But I am big in favor of the pool. <laughs> <laughs> because the, the, man, the, appraisal, I am too. the appraisal management company is a nightmare. Well, they're usually a big conglomerate company based out of New York or some big city, and they have a list of appraisers throughout the country. And they just, whoever get the lowest bid on their appraisal, they get the job. The so lowest bid. So my little appraisal story about that is I had a, a, a client in Jester, and she had to go through a particular lender, and this lender used that appraisal management service. And the appraiser came from Lake Jackson, Texas, which is about four hours from wow. Austin. And he used... Uh, comparables in Jester Farms, which is not even in Austin. And he probably didn't make much money on that with his travel costs and... No, and it delayed our closing for three weeks because I had to go oh, through the appeal process. That's it was a nightmare. ridiculous. So that's I, a nightmare. If, if you're going to buy a house and you're going to get a loan, you ask if they have... 
<laughs> well, that goes back to, to buying local. If you go through a lender that's an online company, they're oh, more online. than often they're more than often going to have an online appraiser. Right, and you never get to see anyone. No, I well, like if they to show up be your able house, to but... touch them. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's important. You, we say a blind process, but it's not against the rules for an appraiser to talk to the real estate agent. They just can't talk to the lender. They can't talk to the lender. Well, and we still talk, but not about value. There can't right. be any pressure of value in there. Um, but for a long time, real estate agents didn't think they could talk to the appraiser either, but that's kind of a myth. We can, oftentimes, even if I'm having a problem with the making the appraisal work for the contract price, I'll call the agent up and say, look, do you have any comps that I'm not seeing? Right. And, if, sometimes and a lot of times they're not there, but sometimes there are there. Yeah, because you get private sales that we know Absolutely. about. Absolutely. But... And as long as we can verify them through the title company or something, mm -hmm. then we can use those. Right. So it's important to be able to pick up the phone and talk to the agent. Yeah, I, I really believe in having a good relationship. And the lender that we use, there is a pool. It's a blind pool, but everybody in the pool is just top-notch like David. And what a great resource to have David or... There are several appraisers in the pool that I have no problem picking up the phone and asking because I know one will specialize in one part of town and I need some help in that part of town and I can pick up the phone and say, hey, help me, I need, right. I need to understand how you would view this or value this and that's why that relationship just makes so much difference. Okay, how long is an appraisal good for? I get uh, asked that a lot. It's kind of at the whim of the underwriter. And it depends on market conditions. If the market's changing rapidly, right. then the amount of time it's good for goes down. But typically about six months is all they'll use an appraisal for, and then they'll have to reorder another one if it... Although there's a lot of really good information in an appraisal besides the value. Absolutely. So I think it, it's really great for a homeowner to have one for all kinds of purposes. Well, you can, you can always go back and pull it out and say, this is my square footage. This is how big my house is. Right. Or if you're selling it, this is my room layout, or this is what, you know, this is what my house has in it. This is what the quality is. This is what the materials are. Right. Show it to somebody. Yeah, that's a, it's a good benchmark. Right. You know, the number goes in and out of validity, but the, uh, the rest of it doesn't. Right, exactly. And then a lot of times I'll get asked, can a homeowner order an appraisal? Absolutely. And I recommend it. If you're unsure or there are... Uh, you know, you're in a subdivision where there are not a lot of home sales, it's good to have that information. With the caveat being there that the homeowner then can't take that appraisal to the lender and the lender can't use that appraisal for the loan process. That's exactly right, but that's okay. Because I also think that it, it it's really great information for a seller so that they're realistic about their, the value of their home. They may decide based on that appraisal not to sell. Absolutely. And that's, that's a good reason to get one. I mean, this may not be the time. So, but at least you get accurate information. And so, again, ordering it uh, as a pre appraisal for marketing purposes and then estate valuation. If you are involved with an estate, this is a really, really vital. Um, well, I do lots of appraisals where it's it's a retrospective value appraisal. I have to go back to the date of death right. and do it based on that date. And a lot of times the accountant will actually do that or his uh, attorney will order that appraisal. So that becomes my client. But that's becoming more and more popular for a reason to get an appraisal. I think if they're heirs and each of the heirs gets to have their own appraiser and it costs $350, why wouldn't you want to do that? You know... I, I'll preach this all day long. Appraisals are cheap. Yeah, they <laughs> I wish are. they were more expensive. I mean, considering the amount of information you get, absolutely. I think the when I started appraising in eighty three, eighty four, I think the cost of an appraisal was either three hundred or three hundred and twenty five dollars. And it's gone at twenty five. It's, it's three seventy five <laughs> now, so inflation hadn't helped us out yeah. much at all. That's good information. To what extent does the condition of the home influence the appraisal? It doesn't and doesn't. And to, I bet you eight out of ten times when I call up somebody to set an appointment to go do the appraisal, they're all, oh, I've got to clean my house. I've got to do this. I've got to do that. You can't come yet. And I'm going, 
<laughs> the stuff on the floor, I'm not looking at. I'm looking at the holes in the wall if there are any, or you know how worn the carpet is. I'm not looking at the dirty dishes in the sink. So, from that aspect, it doesn't make any difference to the appraisal. Now that you bring up a good point, though, because there are certain things that you see while you're there that you would have to note. So, for example, if you saw a big hole in the ceiling and water coming in, you make <laughs> that. Yes, we're not home inspectors, like right. we said. We, but we will look for obvious items of deferred maintenance. Um, and the lender can require those be made, those correct. repairs be made broken, before broken windows or a whole, you know, maybe not like little bitty holes from where a doorknob might have pushed in one place in the house, but significant deferred maintenance in the home we we'll, we will note and it might be a lender required repair and i'm sure um you've run into situations even where you've had to appraise a house that maybe had a house fire or other kinds of things that would be noted on the inspection or, or on the appraisal there i go mixing the two yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but again the appraiser does not check mechanical and but if you could tell that the roof shingles were curling and that's right or, and that might make a difference between us classifying a house as being in good condition as opposed to average. If the carpet's worn in places or if the vinyl's peeling up in the corners, um, then we'll have to go classify that and maybe make an adjustment upward or downward for what kind of condition it's in. Um, do foreclosures affect property values? I've been asked this question a lot over the last couple of years since 2008 when the market kind of took a downturn. Um, and it used to be a bigger deal. Obviously, I think we're starting to come back out of what the problems we had a year or so ago. Austin's been really lucky. Uh, very lucky compared to nationwide, obviously. But um, if I'm in a subdivision doing an appraisal where there's lots of other foreclosures in there, then yes, they do influence the values. So you have to use at least one? As I, don't, a I don't know if I have to. There's no hard and set rule, but the underwriter is going to be Wondering, yeah. With part of the HVCC, there's a new form we have to fill out. It's called the Market Conditions Report, and we have to analyze a year back of the market. And we have to list whether foreclosures are in that market or not. So if we list that there are foreclosures and we don't have any foreclosure data in the report, then they're going to wonder why and ask for it. And so is that where you put whether it's an inclining or a declining or a stable that's in the, market? <laughs> yeah, that's in the neighborhood approach the neighborhood section of the report whether it's stable or increasing or decreasing correct um, but the short answer is yes they can if they are setting the market if they're influencing prices in the market then we should use a foreclosure in that appraisal I've done lots of reports recently where there might be one or two out mm -hmm. of the subdivision and to me those are distressed sales and not representative of the market so okay. I won't use them well that's good to know well, I just want to thank everybody, and especially David, for coming and oh, really um, treating us to a lot of great information. I'm, if you're a buyer, I know you, you might not have ever seen a property appraisal, and I bet David would be so gracious as to give us maybe a sample report that maybe we could post on the website Absolutely. so you can look over and see what a real live report looks Have to like. Block out the names uh, to protect the innocent, and but that other than would that. be <laughs> fine. We don't need to know an address or people's names, but I think it is uh, good, especially if people have never bought a house before, to see what one of those forms looks like. Correct, yeah. I, I think you should always. Uh, understand and know a form before you have to be uh, using it or most people just turn to the second page where the number is but other <laughs> but it is good to familiarize yourself with the whole report right so David thank you so much and thank all of you for coming tonight and joining our webinar and uh, we will be posting it at westaustin.com and so thanks again and have a great evening